Welcome to this Fane online event. I am Joe Lysett and I'm here with my great friend Esme Young. Hello, Esme. Oh, hello, Joe. Hello. Hello, Joe. Hello, Esme. <laughs> to talk about your brilliant book, Behind the Seams, which is wonderful. I, I've just finished it and I really, really enjoyed it. And what I loved about it particularly was that it feels to me like a kind of history of London over the last few years. Oh, well, that's true. As yeah. much as a history of your life and what, the ridiculous life that you've lived. <laughs> well, I tell you, I was terrified people would find it really boring and dull. Yeah. But I guess when you've lived a certain life, it's ordinary yeah. to you. Yeah. Don't you think? Yeah, absolutely. But it wasn't boring to me. It was, <laughs> it was wonderful. I mean, we should start with your family because they didn't have a boring life either. I mean, your father had an extraordinary time in the war. Can you tell us about that story well, about him in the war? It, the whole thing about how he got into the REF was amazing. He, his sister's boyfriend, that they lived in South Africa, his sister's boyfriend used to fly small planes delivering newspapers. Mm. And my dad would go with him yeah. and he'd let him fly it. And then he got obsessed with flying and they were doing a scholarship to go to Cranwell. And he made his father drive all through the night so he could apply for this. And he got, he got in and he won the Sword of Honour, which we still have. My brother has. Oh, I didn't know that. The sword, So the Sword of Honour is from... From being in the war or from no, just from no. flying? It was from being at Cranwell. Oh, I see. So he was the top student and you get given the sword of honour. That's cool, isn't it? Yeah. But he he fought in the war briefly. Well, uh, yes. Um, because he was shot down, wasn't he? He was shot down in Belgium in the Battle of France. Yeah. And how he got... It's it, really amazing. It's amazing, he, this story. Yeah. How he got to do that is he was in his head bloke's office yeah. and the phone went and he picked it up and the guy went, we're looking for somebody to join a 6-5 something squadron. I can't remember. Mm. It was called Churchill's Own. And he said, oh, I know exactly the person. And it was, he, he said his name and off he went to France. And they were in France for quite a long time, flying and all that. And he, I remember him saying that they'd be flying for hours yeah. and then they were put up by French families. And he said that they told him he'd come, he'd come and he was eating supper and he just fell asleep <laughs> <laughs> with his head in the food. I feel like I've seen you do similar things at times. So Are you runs, sure? runs in the family falling asleep yeah. at times. And uh, so he, he uh, went to France and w how old were you at this stage? I wasn't born. Oh, you weren't even born at that no, Of course, no. yes, yeah, sorry, excuse me. Um, how and dare you? I, I know, so rude of me. <laughs> um, and because, uh, yes, he, he ended up flying uh, to Belgium Hurricanes. and was shot down and remembered his training, right, that he had to yes. jump out and yes. jump forward? Yes, jump forward. So, so that you didn't, didn't get, get hit, hit by the plane behind yeah. you. Well, no, by... The wings of the plane. Oh, I see. Oh, yeah. If you jump yes. out the side, you'd be hit by the wind. Yeah. God, it's so stressful, isn't it? And so he's 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 been shot down, but he's he's not injured at this stage. He's no, up... he is. Oh, is he's he? He's burnt. Right. His face and hands were burnt. As he was coming down, he was shot at. He also something that actually isn't in the book, the book that he said all his clothes were burnt off him right and they were going like this to him oh is it jerry and he was going no i'm a dancing girl because <laughs> <laughs> he was naked with just his boots on but he he they tried to they, he'd been behind british lines and they yes. tried to shoot at him yes and yes. someone threw a grenade yes and... he had a scar on his side well it was this side it was that long i mean Honestly, he was so lucky. Unbelievably lucky. But, you know, I think that is how people survive if they're injured in a war or something. How they survive is by luck. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. He was lucky this, this Afrikaans, South African guy who was driving the ambulance, came, 
happened to be going by and they had a chat. Well, I'm sure my dad was kind of off his head, really. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Got in the ambulance and he, I'll tell you another thing. He put a bandage or something in his side and he was, my dad was moved around. And this wasn't discovered till days later. And he was so lucky it didn't get affected, yeah. infected. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's so lucky that all of these things happened because without it, all of that happening, yeah. we wouldn't have you here. No. And we wouldn't have all these amazing stories and this, yeah, extraordinary. But, you know, he went back to flying. He, um, I, I mean, they wouldn't, you wouldn't, let, would you? They wouldn't let him fly a fighter plane, but he flew Sutherlands, which they went out in the Atlantic looking for submarines. And I can remember him saying that they found this submarine, but they were waiting for the ship to come. Mm. And they were, they only just got back because the petrol nearly ran out. I mean, so amazing. lucky. Luck, lucking, lucky. Yeah, very lucky. Well, I'm, I'm glad he survived. Um, Me so too. That you're here. <laughs> and so then you came along and um, you studied, uh, well, when you were a child, you were, spent a lot of time with monks and nuns. Well, only nuns. Only nuns, okay. It was the convent of the Holy Ghost, Bromham Road, right. Bedford. My mum went there, my sister went there, my auntie went there. So you're very religious. Oh, God, yes. Yes, of course. Yeah, yeah. I love your brother Angus had this joke about... Um, oh, God. He dressed up as uh, Jesus on the yes. cross, didn't he? And what was his joke? I, it made me laugh out loud reading it in the book. What, it, he went, what a way... To, so he was going like this, and he said, what a way to spend Easter. <laughs> <laughs> and the monks didn't think that was funny. No, <laughs> no I'm sure they didn't. No. I certainly did. I loved that little gag in the book. It's great. And when you were a kid, that's when your uh, fascination in sewing started. And yes. You did a lot of alterations, didn't you? It was sort of guerrilla sewing is what I like to think of it as. Because you would take your mum's clothes and alter them. Did she did she approve of this? Did she agree to any of this? Of course she didn't. <laughs> <laughs> she would not walk down the street with me when I was a teenager. Yeah. She really hated what I wore. Mm. You know, she sort of loved me to marry a duke. <laughs> but, oh, really? Yes. But I think she thought the way she's looking, that's never going to happen. Yeah. What sort of stuff was it? Like, what, what kind of outfits were you um, creating? Well, most of it was bought from jumble sales and then altered. Right. And we didn't care how we altered them. We'd take a great chunk out the back, a bit like I did to my mum's clothes. I mean, she locked the cupboard. I'm actually not <laughs> surprised she was pissed off. <laughs> no, I'm not. Yeah. I would be pissed yeah, off. Yeah, I'd be pissed off, yeah. Yeah. So it's very colourful and unusual shapes, that kind of thing. You were sort yeah, of experimenting and, with that kind of and thing. And I can remember one... I can remember making clothes to go to parties. And I can remember the first party outfit I ever made was so badly made, honestly. It was a gingham, black and white gingham waistcoat and skirt, no lining, no facings, awful, right. absolutely awful. Did it look I, good though? Oh, I looked so cool. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's all that matters, isn't it? Um, so, so yeah, you um, you started your sewing then, and then uh, you ended up in in London. And um, I rem it, one of the little details in the book which I loved was about um, Old Compton Street, where you would go to. Um, oh yes. To buy brie. Yes. So the cheese wasn't that uh, readily available at that time. Is well, that right? it was a French shop. It oh, was a French shop where you could go and buy French food, you yeah. know, and French cheeses and all that. And my mum, <coughs> and my mum, when she was a teenager at her, at the convent at the Bromont Road, Bedford, yeah. Holy Ghost, she was sent to France. And for stayed with this French family mm. at, and learnt French, and she really got into French food. So she'd make me go and buy the brie and take it home to her. Oh, I see. But the shop's not there anymore. No, no. no. Uh, that's that's one of the things that I'm 
I've loved about the book, as I said, that, that it's sort of this sort of history of London, and there are places in there that you reference um, quite a lot, like the French House, for example, oh, yeah. which is still there, and then these the French cheese shop, which is not. not there. But um, do you think uh, sort of your your um, love of London in lockdown sort of came from a lot of this? Because in lockdown, you were wandering around London doing a lot of uh, walking obviously because that's all we could do and you were photographing quite a lot of it for Instagram yeah. weren't you and um was there anything that sort of you were completely amazed by that it come, was still there or that it oh changed? yes I mean you know I do walk quite a lot so mm. I walk to my workshop sometimes I walk to college but you work walk from A to B yeah you don't wander but with the lockdown I just wandered and I live near the city and there are so many modern tall buildings. Mm. Actually, out of my kitchen window, the only tall building when I moved there, which in 1983, was the NatWest building. Right. I can't see it anymore. Oh, wow. Yeah. Well, it's I really wish I had taken pictures every month. Because yeah. imagine yeah. how that would be anyway completely different yeah. but you know in the city there are still old buildings and alleyways and you know it was it was great brilliant yeah, yeah. and nobody about no well, yeah which was a sort of weird gift i suppose and lots of well ways, it, was, yeah. it was i quite liked it um you've got a lot of siblings you've got christopher and angus and uh fiona, fiona and christopher uh uh, one of the stories in the book about Christopher is that it took you 15 years <laughs> to pay him back for... <laughs> you were on holiday, weren't you? Yeah. What what happened there? I have no idea. <laughs> so I went on holiday with the boyfriend and we hitchhiked to, well, in fact, Spain. Mm. And there's that story in the book where we got, not poisoned, but we got given this food that we passed out. Well, yeah. I didn't pass out. I vomited out mm. the window. Mm. It was actually quite scary. You've had quite a few scary <laughs> trips, haven't you? You've been... Like what? Well, I mean, there's the story about uh, more recently when you went to Iran and you found oh, yes. Iran to be absolutely amazing, but you were terrified going there, but then actually had said it was yeah. one of the most welcoming places you've ever been to. It was amazing. And I got um, somebody asked me to marry them. Oh, and what was the answer? I said, no, I don't think so. Mm. Just like that? Just, <laughs> just, like, just like that. that. It was in this park. It was strange. Yeah. And there was a, another trip that you went on with your brother. I'm trying to remember which one it was, where you were. And you were um, you, you were driving. You, you got this taxi that started going against the map. Oh, that was in Mexico. Yeah. Because he lived in Mexico City. And... He was working there, and we decided for Christmas to fly to Oaxaca. And we were up virtually all night. I'm not quite sure I'm doing what, but anyway, we missed the plane. So our friend who lived in the house said, well, let's get a taxi. Why don't you get a taxi? So we got this taxi, and he took down the number. Mm. Then it was a VW Beetle and they drove somewhere in Mexico City and put us in another car, a much bigger car. Yeah. And my brother was going, oh, my God. Yeah, you're in and trouble. And he, he hid all the money in his sock. <laughs> <laughs> and he thought, oh, God, <laughs> what's going to happen? But it was absolutely fine. Yeah. I mean, it was, well, he was more scared than I was. Yeah. And he was looking at the map and going, oh, and that was the other thing that happened is they went north instead of south or east instead of west. Mm. And he was thinking, what the hell is going on here? Mm. But they did that to get cheaper petrol. Yes. You do seem to uh, be quite open to putting yourself into situations where you might be in grave danger. And... I mean, when I first met you, I obviously really liked you immediately, but you didn't strike me as someone who was sort of uh, putting yourself in scary situations like that. But I suppose, did that come from, I mean, maybe when you were uh, living in squats and all of the kind of the thrills and things of, that came with that? I think, I think 
I will. I'm somebody who'll go for go for it. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Whatever. Mm. You know. Well, look, going for the same B. I just thought, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? It's all worked out pretty well. Well, it has, you're right. Yeah, you've been very lucky with your going for whatever. Well, I have, actually. Yeah, none you're... of it's sort of gone horribly wrong, has it? You've all got you've got all your limbs. Let's touch wood. Yes, we need some, yeah. I'll touch a plant. Oh, no, yeah, there you go. There's wood. a book. Oh, there we yeah, go. Yeah, yeah, we don't want yeah. you in trouble. Um, uh, yes, right. So, very much on this theme... One of the revelations for me in the book was there's a picture in the book of you on a bike, which you showed to yes. us at Sewing Bee. And I just thought, oh, that's Esme sort of posing with a bike, but hasn't, you know, can't ride a bike. But you learnt to ride a bike, a motorbike, and were a biker chick for a while. Oh, yeah, I was. Yeah. And how, like, how, how many years were you riding bikes for? Like? I can't remember. Okay. 10 years, maybe. Yeah. Okay, so it's had a big part of your life. A bit longer. And there's a story in the book about how you fell off the bike because of a fit bus driver. <laughs> yes. Can you tell us about that? <laughs> right. Well, it was in Notting Hill, and I was, I don't know where I was going, actually. And I was overtaking this bus, and I looked up, and I saw this guy, and he was so handsome. <laughs> And then this car came across, I hadn't even seen it. I crashed into it. That's the only time I fell off my motorbike. What about when I won the race as well? Oh, yeah, yeah. Against then, all the lads. Yes. Yeah. That was... But when you fell off the bike, wasn't didn't someone come and oh, yes. scoop you up? Yes. And it um, wasn't the handsome bus driver, was it? Oh, God. It was... It was a, um, a singer in the clash. Yes. Oh God, my brain. Yeah. <laughs> what was his I've name? forgotten his name now as well. It's in the book. Joe Strummer. Joe Strummer. That's it. Yes. Yeah. yeah he came. He was just there. We were right. Well, they all lived in squats too. Right. You know. So he wasn't behind you on the bike or anything. He no, just happened to be in the area. Walking down the street. Oh, that says my young. She's just yes. crashed you know, into a car because of a fit bus driver. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, Sid Vicious lived next door. To right. me and squat with my brother. Yeah. I mean, in those days, it, this is something that I feel quite strongly about, is in those days, London was such a creative place mm. and it was cheap. We squatted, we rented a shop. People can't do, young people can't do that anymore. No. I know I'm not saying they're not as creative or... I mean, I know what we felt is, yeah, why not? Yeah. You can do anything you want. Yeah. And it's, yeah, London is not the same no. in any way. Yeah, no. Yeah. It's such a shame. Yeah. And and it's all the kind of characters and mixing of people that happened in that time, which was so sort of powerful and helpful for everyone's creativity. And there's people like, you mentioned Piers Corbyn was doing protests on top of one of the squats. <laughs> yes. Like, the squat I lived in. And also that woman, oh God, I can't remember her name, who set up that, actually, that's reminded me. I had this boyfriend who, we went to this party and somebody put some acid. I went home, somebody dropped some acid in his drink. Mm. And then... Was it you? It certainly was not. Okay, yeah. Somebody put some acid in the drink. Yeah. Okay. And he he was out on the street. He completely freaked out mm. and was arrested. And this woman got a sl oh God, honestly, hopeless. <laughs> um, and in fact, my dad, he he he. I I didn't put this in the book, did I? No, no. It's a little <laughs> scoop for <laughs> us. Um, my dad was a witness in the court and stood up and. So what a good guy it was. Yeah. It got was him quite, off. Wow. That's yeah. amazing. Yeah, it was amazing. <laughs> but he was also You got away with it. Brixton prison on remand. That was your boyfriend? Yeah. Still in touch or? No. No. Well, why would I be? <laughs> it was scary. I have to say it was really scary. Yeah. And uh, you, you, uh, uh, one of your other brothers, I forget which one it was, um, one of the, he was very open to having, there was a homeless man that he allowed to come oh, stay yes. in the squats who was nicking handbags. Yeah. Yes. And at one point went out in with a chair and then he realised he probably shouldn't be doing <laughs> yes. this. Yes, that was in Elgin Ave. Yeah. The squat I lived in as yeah. well. 
So do your brothers have that similar sentiment, that sort of similar approach to life, which is to sort of go for it? Or... Oh, yeah, definitely. Mm. I mean, the th so my sister was five years older, Fiona, and Jeremy, the youngest brother, was about five years younger than... So the three of us, me, Angus and Chris, we were a gang and we all... Chris worked in the city... And he used to go to the city on his motorbike with his Bieber Wellington boots, which were glitter, and a leather jacket. And he'd get there and he'd change into his suit. Can you imagine? That's amazing, yeah. Yeah. I mean, if I worked in the city, that's exactly what I'd do as well. Yeah, he didn't, he didn't really like it there. No, it sounds he like it, maybe not the sort of world for him. Yeah, you should see him now. His hair stuck in his beards. Amazing. Uh, he's so eccentric. I mean, it's a family of eccentrics, isn't it? Um, you you uh, then obviously started uh, Swanky Modes. Um, um, how different, you talk about London being very different um, at the time and how easy comparatively it is now to sort of finding a place to set your studio up and all of that what was the industry like the fashion industry then was it uh, something that you felt easy to get into or yes because sort of five years or maybe 10 no five years before we set up our shop there were shops like Mary Quant, Bieber all that it will it was a sort of culture that yeah. you opened a shop yeah and Vivian Westwood and you know that was what you did. Yeah. You opened a shop. Yeah. And you would make all the clothes there, wouldn't you? There yes. Was no, you, and and they, all four of you made the clothes. There was nobody else doing it, was well, there? Well, not to begin with. Yeah. But then when we got orders and things, yeah. we sent them to very small local factories yeah, to yeah. be made. But it, 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 you get this sense reading the book of this sort of a real hive of activity, a real everyone's working all hours and coming up with designs and yeah. how did you uh com comparatively to other studios at that time or fashion houses you would for women was that the norm or was that uh no. no that was really really unusual yeah that we were four women no men involved i mean obviously we had partners and you know husbands boyfriends yeah but really unusual that it was for women mm. and also we had we knew lots of singers and musicians and all I mean that's the whole thing at that time about London the creative hub was all sorts of people yes you know and we did various musicals god knows that I, I mean, found amazing <laughs> that you did a full musical to promote yes. one of your collections, yeah. didn't you? Yeah. Which is insane. But before that, we did one at the ICA. We were asked, they would do, they asked lots of fashion designers mm. to do a talk. And we thought, nah, you don't <laughs> want to sit on stage and be questioned. Yeah. So we did this little <laughs> show called Crimes of Passion Fashion. And a Boy George was involved? No, that was in the next oh, was that one. In the next one? That okay, right. seems like a dream. Right. Which was to, we did that to welcome the 1980s. So we did a retrospective. Right. And Boy George was an usherette oh, wearing right. swanky mode. Yes. Because uh, there's a, a potential accusation in the book. Really? About, uh, you, you heard an interview with Boy George. After, after that performance, you, you, somebody Curious. noticed that yeah. those those money had gone from the petty cash, and uh, you uh, heard in an interview with Boy George years later that at, around that time, in order to keep himself going, he was nicking yes. money from jobs he was doing. So, do you think? Who knows? Have you seen him? Have you asked him? No, I haven't actually. We should see if we can get hold of Boy George yes. and see if he robbed from you. Well, Do you know how much it was? How much are we looking oh, for? I can't remember. Because with inflation, it, it was, you might be able to might yeah. be a nice oh, bit of yeah. extra like, cash. Like, that's what happened with my brother, me paying him back the money. Mm. He worked out how much it would be with inflation, and that's what I had to pay. It's quite smart, really. I mean, he works oh, in the city, oh, he doesn't he? So. No, not any longer, he doesn't. Yeah, yeah, but 
he's got that kind oh, of oh, financial he's, mind. Yes. He's not letting <laughs> he's, it go. Well, he's he was a mathematician, mm. so yeah, he did right maths there. and logic. Yeah, not the sort of person you should be borrowing money off. No, you want someone who's not. not good with sums that you can. Yeah, a bit of exactly. advice for the future. Exactly. Um, so swanky modes didn't sort of take off really until the Nova magazine shoot with Grace Jones. Is that right? No, it was the time. It was Nova magazine was the plastic mags. So when we first started, we bought fabrics from local shops, but they weren't fabric shops. Um, with that picture of me on the motorbike, mm. I'm wearing an outfit which was car seat upholstery from the fifties. Oh, that wow. we bought. <laughs> when I used <laughs> Amazing. to, yeah, when I used to come from Elgin Ave to Camden, I used to go past this shop. So one day I stopped and. Mm. You, you wouldn't use car seat upholstery now, would you? Like you wouldn't be dressed in a Fiat five hundreds chair, would you? Well, I've no idea what that looked like. It's just horrible I, grey. I, it's not yeah. worth it. Yeah, not leopard skin. So, so I've got this wrong then. So, uh, uh, I thought that Grace Jones wore the plastic Mac in Nova magazine. No, no, no. What? It was, but it was the first. Sorry, the lock dress. She wore the lock dress. Yeah, padlock dress. Yeah, in time, in the time in she the times, wore yeah. the padlock dress. But was it the plastic Mac that really got Swanky yes. Mode going? That's right. Yes, but it, it wasn't Grace Jones who was in it. No. Okay. No. It was just a fashion yeah. story. But it was so unusual because so it was a it yeah. was a, a full Mac that was made with see-through transparent plastic. Well, some of it was tr completely transparent. Oh, and it had pockets with sweets in. Oh, uh, <laughs> love it. Yeah. Well, it was they were put between two bits of plastic. Yeah, yeah. And um, people loved it, didn't they? You couldn't, yes. They were yeah, just flying out the doors. Yeah, had queues outside. Yeah. And if that ha hadn't happened, I think, well, who knows what, mm. but it was a real positive yeah. for us. And that launched Swanky yes, Modes. Yes, definitely. And then you had Grace Jones in the padlock yes. dress. Yeah. Which again was a huge, huge deal. Yes. And then and you were working with that unbelievable... One of the people that you worked with that I wanted to ask you about is Divine, the drag queen Divine. Oh. Who I'm obsessed with. Oh, and lots of people don't you? know outside of sort of drag culture who Divine is. Um. Well, we did... Have you heard of Andrew Logan's Miss World? No. I don't think so. He's mm. going to do one this year. Right. Um. So every year he used to do Andrew... Logan's Miss World. Is it like a? It's um. You do, you mention it in the book. It's a. It's like a Miss World. Yes. Parody almost, or sort yes. of like yeah, yeah. So um, oh, Derek Jarman won it one year, dressed up as a woman. Right. And that there's two sisters who used to do it, and they were naked, but their bodies were painted because it was you know swimwear, daywear, and evening wear. Mm. And they would paint their bodies for these different categories. Anyway, Divine was the presenter. Oh, really? Yeah, oh, one really? year. We were doing... So there was this woman called Yvonne Gold, who was a makeup artist, who came to Swanky Modes when she was still at school, right. 15. Yeah. She was a big fan. And then... She, I don't know how this happened, but she decided she was going to sing, or maybe we... I don't know. Mm. And we dressed her, and then we were the backing singers, and we were all in these lycra all in ones with conical leather bosoms. Way before Madonna did yeah. it. Yeah. yeah. And we had blonde wigs, and Divine said we were her daughters. Yeah. I mean, that is that's an amazing thing to be to me. With I love that that sort of culture of that time, and Divine. There's a brilliant documentary about Divine. Oh, um, is that? And John Waters. And, oh, yes. Because, yes. I mean, Divine did some pretty extraordinary, sort of scary. There's a, there's a film of Divine eating a dog turd. Oh, that's yes. A, like a, a yes. Thing. God, what was that film? Like literally yeah. just picking it up off the yeah. street and eating it. I mean, it, some crackers stuff yeah. that they got up to. So I'm glad, I'm glad you didn't get up to any of that, <laughs> but amazing to have been part of that. Yeah, I've worked... got a picture of us. A all with her have you yeah. i'd love to see that if you could find that i'd love to see it and yeah you've worked with a lot of celebrities um Cher, yes. renee zellweger 
And then Dale Winton oh, pops yes. up, which I was not expecting. And I'd completely forgotten that he's in train spotting because he talks to, um, uh, is it Ewan McGregor's character he talks to? I've, yes. Uh, it's been a while yeah. since I've seen it through the television. And you made Dale Winton's sparkly jacket yes. for it, didn't you? Well, suit. It was a whole suit. <laughs> it was a shirt, a jacket, trousers, and a tie all in lurex. Then the. So he was the doctor, and then there was someone was the nurse. But that this was the fantasy of the in the lyrics of suit, mm. and the person who was the nurse was someone called Rachel Fleming, who'd worked at Swanky Modes and then became a costume designer. Right. And the outfit she wore was the flash dress, which was a Swanky Modes, a version of one of Swanky Modes dresses. Amazing. Yeah, yeah so sort of fun. keeping it going. Um, because so, so just to go back to um, swanky modes. So, uh, you as as a four of you, you kind of worked together very closely for a long time, and then gradually families started and yes. people started to peel away. And was there ever a sense that you wanted to sort of keep swanky because you were sort of almost last woman standing, really, weren't you? Because you yeah. you didn't it hadn't had the kids and all that and that yeah. dragged some of them away. Did you feel ever like keeping it going just as you or or do you feel well, like it was the four i didn't i yeah i thought it was the four and what happened is our lease was coming up and i was thinking shall i renew it or not and it felt like you know time. we've had a fabulous time yeah this is the end yeah do you have a favorite collection from what you did with swanky modes anything that you were like that's that that's the thing I'm most proud of at that time. Um, I don't actually. Mm. I don't. Yeah. Um, they always had a theme, the collections, and they would change. So normally a designer will have clothes they repeat in different fabrics and all that. Mm. And they're the ones that sell, but yeah. we kept going, changing, and yeah. all that. Well, that's probably the power of it, right? That you kept changing and well, and also, for us, anyway. yeah, yes, yeah. and also how great you were as collaborators because you were very, um, as you say in the book, you, there was never any kind of um, huge falling outs or no. tips or whatever. No. Obviously, you disagreed with them things, and yeah. that's natural. But you, you talk about there was a, a coat that you had sort of presented, and they all had a go at you about oh, it. Yes, it was mix. a dress, um, and they. But, you know, that's how it worked. We would maybe make something, then we'd have a discussion and things would change or not change. And we'd go, what do you think of this? And, you know, so it was definitely all of us contributing to the collections. Yeah, yeah. And that, I mean, is quite rare, I imagine, to have... Well, I think, yes. Definitely. Even now or then, you know, just to have some that many creative voices and for it to work is yeah, an yeah. amazing achievement, really. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Incredible. And, you know, I'm still friends with all of them. We're all still friends. Yeah. Which is brilliant. Yeah. So after that, then you started working um, in film and television, and that's when you worked with Dale Winton. Yes. Uh, and you say in the book that, uh, celebrities are always kind to you. You've never had any celebrities that you've worked with that have shouted at you or had any sort of deverishness. Why do you think that is? Because I've definitely heard other people that work with celebrities. I've worked with celebrities who are not necessarily that, you know, nice. And do you think there's something about the way that you approach them that... I have no idea. Mm. But i tell you one thing, maybe, is I'm not scared. Mm. Well, actually... The only celebrity I met that I became slightly scared, well, I wouldn't say scared, but like, oh my God, mm. was Dustin Hoffman. You love Dustin Hoffman, don't you? Yeah. What was, yeah, tell us about that. Well, it, I think it's to do with my age mm. that he was in all sorts of film, films when I was young yeah. that I went to see. And I can't remember the name of the film he was in. But I went to do some fittings with him and I, I knew it was going to be him. Yeah. But when I met him, it was like, uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's him. Yeah. And but he then, was nice to you. Oh, very nice to me. And then at the rap party, 
he asked me to dance with him. So we were dancing, disco dance. Like, well, was it disco? I don't know. Yeah, yeah. And so have you kept in touch with him? Yeah. No, no. No. But you danced with Dustin Hoffman. I did. It's definitely something <laughs> something to tell. Yes. It's definitely a story to tell, isn't it? Um, uh, I, well, I, I, yes. Um, you, uh, the other celebrity that you talk about in the book, which it's funny that you say Dustin Hoffman, you're amazed by, but... And that's the only one because you met David Bowie, didn't you? And that's one of the stories oh, that yes. emerged. Uh, you mentioned it very briefly on the sewing bee in a very cool way. I, I thought it was just, a, oh, yes, I sat on the balcony of David Bowie and then we all moved on. But what, what was the story there? Well, it's interesting in the sewing bee, it was because it was talking about carnival. And I suddenly thought, oh, yes, when I was in the Notting Hill carnival, I sat on the window ledge with David Bowie. <laughs> <laughs> amazing. And it was amazing. Yeah. yeah. And it was a party that always happened there for yes. a friend of yours that yes. owned a house on uh, on that yeah. march. Yeah. Uh, along the carnival. Yeah. And he'd been working she well there were David two had them. been working with her, yes. Yeah, there was two of them. One a record producer and Cynthia who I don't quite know what her job was, but she would go between the producer of the film and the stars and do stuff. Yeah. So that's how he was invited. Mm. And I think she didn't think he'd come. Yeah. But boy, oh boy, he did. Yeah. But he also very much liked um, Mel, who was one of Swanky Moses' daughter. Right. Who he'd had some kind of, you know, he, he liked her. Mm. So he was upstairs chatting to her. She was probably about seven, six or seven. Right, yeah. And I went up to look for her. Mm. And there he was. And there we went, sat on the window ledge. I love it. And then he went off onto the, yes. followed followed yeah. the uh, the carnival, yeah. didn't he? Yeah. 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 You, do you, you never saw him again? Nope. Wow. Never. Yeah. <laughs> I wasn't scared story. of him. No, I would have been. I'm scared of Cher. I would have been scared of all of these people. I think that's that is key, though, isn't it? If you're not scared, they almost are sort of they're used to people being scared of them, so then they become scared of you, maybe. Maybe. I, yeah. I don't want to see. mess with Esme. Yeah. I mean, I wouldn't want to mess with you. Well, you know, when you said we got watched the Sang Bee. Yes, the, she likes the Sang Bee, doesn't she? Well, the very first episode I was in because I was working on the third. Um, Bridget Jones. Mm. Was it called Bridget Jones Baby? Yeah, I think Something so. Like that. One of those, yeah. Um, I made various things for it. Then she came back to do pickups. So I went to her, told to, you know, do fittings and tweak things. Mm. And Natalie, her share workshop with, who's also a costume designer, said to her, Oh, Esme's going to be on the telly tonight. <laughs> So she watched it, and the next day she said to Natalie, oh, I thought it was great. Oh, I love it. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, amazing. Another person who probably fancies Patrick as well. Oh, well. Hmm. God, the amount of people. Do you get it as well where people say, oh, what's, well, could you get me in touch with Patrick? Well, yes, I do. I always just give his number, I think. Is that it? Of course you do. Yeah, and his email. Email, a full address. Yeah. Mother's maiden name. Yeah. Yeah. Why not? Well... Let's talk about Sewing Bee. So that's obviously where you and I met on the Sewing Bee. And you said, um, I remember you telling me this, that uh, a friend of yours said when you got the job um, on Sewing Bee that you'd gone over to the other side. Uh, yes. Because you'd obviously worked behind the camera <laughs> yeah. for so long and then suddenly on the other side. Do, do you feel that? Do you feel like there was this sort of transition from... No. 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 The, the person who said that was this guy called Andrew McDonald, who's married to Rachel Fleming, and he's um, a film producer. He, he produced Train Spotting, right. The Beach. Well, I don't know. Yeah, lots of sorts. Yeah, yeah. Um, so he, he's the one that said that to me, mm. gone to the other side. <laughs> yeah. But I, you know, no, I don't feel that. Yeah. Well, you are on the other side. How does it feel? Which side? The right hand side yeah. or the well, left hand? Currently on this side, so yeah. I'm on the right hand side. Aren't I? <laughs> you are. You're on the right hand side. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Does it feel nice to be on the right hand side? 
Well, it feels nice to be on the right hand side and the left hand side. Yeah, I don't mind yeah. either way. You're up for anything. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I, well, I am. Yeah, ish to a degree. Yeah. So you um, you said, uh, and and this is sort of maybe one of the few times that you weren't maybe not scared, but you kind of um, you you realised that you really wanted the job when you were going for the the uh, sort of auditions and the um, the, oh, the, the testing yeah. things they do where they sort of film you or whatever. So what 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 was that experience like? Did you did, when because you were asked because you'd spoken to someone at a party yeah, about yeah. about yeah. it, and then at what point did you go? Oh, actually, I really want to do this. Well, I did an interview audition, mm. and I mean it was I enjoyed it, and then after that, I thought, you know what? If I don't get it, I don't get it, mm. and I couldn't have done any better in mm. the audition yeah but then they asked me to do more and that that's when I thought oh yes I would like to do this yeah and yeah. what if I don't get it yes yeah but I did but you got it you very I much got it. got it and uh Suzanne Rock who was the yeah and is the producer as um exec producer said uh that you basically got it the first time that they met you right yeah, she said that to me. She, yeah, that's good, yeah. good to know, isn't it? I can see why. And you've done now four series, five? Oh, I can't remember. You've done a few, haven't you? Yeah. yeah. Five? Well, I did three, and you've done one before and one after I left. So, yeah, you've done five now. Yeah. Yeah. And do you have a... Uh, like a, a favourite garment or something that's come out of it or a, a sewer that you've been so impressed by? Is there any one that's like out of those five years you've gone, wow, that's like um, a real talent? Or Well, one thing I think is interesting, well, interesting for me, is that some are really good at sewing, but some then are more creative. Mm. And creativity is very important for me. And I always say... That the first challenge, the pattern challenge, is all to do about sewing. Mm. The transformation is to do about creativity. And they know only have an hour and a half mm. to make, you know. I mean, where, yeah, it, that's always my favorite challenge yes, is the transformation. Me too. Yeah. Then the last one, the made to measure, for me, is a combination. And so it's not just about sewing. And one thing I find really really positive and amazing is it's a bit like my students actually they'll start off in the beginning not that good and as it goes through they get better and better mm. and they help each other and that's exactly what happens with my students yes yeah and yeah. they're learning yeah all the time i think I think that's amazing. It's extraordinary to watch that process, isn't it, over the over the weeks yeah. as they kind of yeah. build up their confidence and yeah. start to push outside their comfort yeah. zones. And yeah, I love not even just with sewing, like all creativity. When I see yeah. that kind of process happening, it's yeah. really exciting, and anything could happen, couldn't it? Well, exactly, because you know people will be used to making certain things. But then they might be asked to make something they've never ever made before. Yeah, yeah. So it's like, ah. Oh. Yeah. But well, it's great. That's what, they learn. That's what they need, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And one of the things I was uh, really delighted about um, when I was um, on the show was that both you and Patrick are so up for those sketches and oh, yes. being silly and, and, and being partners of those. Because the fashion industry to me sometimes seen as sort of quite sort of very Victoria Beckham, very sort of, you know, not smiling, really, whatever. And both of you have got that very open, lovely way about you where you go, yeah, well, let's have a go at that. And I'm so impressed with your comedic abilities and your, your timing is impeccable. Is it? It really is. You saying that to me, bloody hell. It's, it's really good. Particularly, there's a one that we did where um, it was the start of an episode, and I think it was like a, a winter episode, and it was it starts with me sort of as a close up, and it's snowing, and then oh, it yes. sort of pans out, and you're grating cheddar, uh, yes. parmesan pa over the top parmesan. of me, and that's the yeah. that's the uh, that's the snow, and I, I can't remember what the line was, but it was something along the lines of. Um, uh, I, I can't really like I this. Can't, it's something to do with a lasagna or something, I think. I don't know, yeah. but it was just so well delivered and so brilliantly done. 
Do you think a career in comedy, little side business? Well, I'm a one-liner, so I think if I did comedy, I couldn't stand up right. there and remember yeah. the whole thing. Yes. What I do is one-liners. Yeah, yeah. Don't, don't think. Yeah, so maybe a sort of um, a double act. Yes, there's a thought. Mm. You and Patrick would make to? a good double act. Well, I'd, I'd do it as well, yeah. <laughs> I'll I'll, no. I'll write something up and okay. see what happens. No, we are very good. And I, one thing I find hilarious is he's so tall and I'm so small. Yeah. I always go little and large. Yeah, yeah. It works well, though. It's a really, yeah. Um, uh, to, to, just moving on to one of your students. So um, you, you have a very close relationship with one of your students called um, Ashish, who makes extraordinary clothes. I mean... I love Ashish stuff. Yeah, amazing. And and he started with you at Central St. Martin's, yes. didn't he? And you've just worked with him ever since, haven't you? What's... So I worked on his MA collection, which I think was 99, um, 2000. Mm. And oh, his collection had huge bows. Oh, uh, you do love <laughs> huge, a bow. Huge, huge bows. And um, he's a very, very nice man he you know when he has people in turns he always makes sure he pays them mm. and you know quite a few fashion places they won't pay them and they take big advantage yeah anyway yes after he he left St Martin's done his collection he went to Paris to go for an interview I can't remember and he lost his portfolio oh yeah and it, there was no backup, was there? No, it was all... because, yeah, not on. Yeah. So I'd always said to him, do your own collections and take advantage of all the fabulous things in India, you know, all the handmade stuff. So in the end, that's what he did. He started um, doing sequin stuff mm. and all that. And, and you've worn quite a lot of his stuff on the yes. same Yes, oh, I you? have. Always for the final... I wear something of his. Yeah, and I'm always a bit jealous of it because <laughs> it's more sparkly than whatever I've managed yeah. to find. And more special, and actually. Way more special, yeah. yeah, yeah. I just grabbed mine from a gutter, essentially, and you're <laughs> working with an amazing designer. Well, you know, uh, Sane B was up for the BAFTAs. Yes, yes of course robbed, you do. Robbed. But also you were up, so you were up for two. Mm, yeah. But the outfit I wore was a Nashish. Was it? So I cut the pattern, did the design, and he... T so I said to him, oh, I'm going to the BAFTAs, can I borrow something? He said, no, I'll make you something. Amazing. Wasn't that nice? But, I mean, his stuff is... Uh, he uses sequins a lot. How, I mean, it looks so intricate. How, how do you even start to make something with that level of detail? Well, so cut a pattern. The, the thing about the sequining... It's, it's not like if you buy sequin fabric, the thread is just goes through all of them. Mm. So it's handmade. They've probably got five sequins, then it's knotted off. And it's men who make it mm. traditionally. And you have a great big, um, what would you call it? Like a square. Square out of wood. Right. And you stretch the fabric over and they do it with a hook and they go, and my, my, when I first work, worked for Ashish, I said, now, Ashish, I hope it's not children doing it. Mm. And he went, children couldn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> you have to be really strong. Yeah, yeah. So it's traditionally men doing it. And how long to make? I mean, so if one of those jackets where it's all sequins all over, how long is that to produce? I don't know, to tell you the truth. Yeah, long time. But, well... His people who work for him are amazing. Mm. The things they can do are unbelievable. Yeah. It's like, wow. Yeah. I mean, it really is. The complicated patterns and it's mind-boggling. And would you say, because you um, uh, you did this um, project with, I've just got his name here, which is quite recently, Alistair O'Neill, about oh, yes. pattern cutting, this amazing book that you worked with him on. And you went to see some of these sort of iconic uh, pieces that yeah. were made by different designers, yeah. Balenciaga and all these people. Yeah. Would you say that uh, Ashish's work is 
kind of more complicated than all of those or what's, what's sort of the most complicated stuff that you've seen? Well, so we did VRNA, we did Balenciaga, we did Halston, we did Charles James, who you've probably never heard of. Mm. So four. Oh, and Com, Com de Gas. Right. The thing about all these designers, and same with Ashish, they have a vision. Yeah. And it's their vision, and they're really imaginative. Yeah. And it's all a lot to do with the pattern cutting. Yeah. And quite a few of them, parents were cutters or so. So like Balenciaga, his mum was sewed for some duke in Spain. Mm. I don't know who. But um, also Com de Garçon, they, I've forgotten her name, Ray, oh, you know, I can't pronounce it actually. Mm. <laughs> So in in the 19, I think it was 19, just after the First World War, or maybe it was before, I can't remember, there was an exhibition in Paris of kimonos. And Vionnet um, got really influenced by them. Mm. And this is my theory anyway. And she made, no, she did get influenced. And she made clothes that were really influenced by the kimonos. Then she had an exhibition in Tokyo in the early 70s, late 60s. And I believe that Com got influenced by that. In that, they went, hang on a minute. We can do stuff that's to do about traditional Japanese things, but subvert them. Yes, yeah. So I find that all that... You know, always fashion relates to something in the past, always. Mm. Yeah. But then it gets transformed into something new. Yes. I mean, so much creativity is like that, isn't yeah. it? You know, sort of, yes, you're right. My, my yeah. mum always says sort of, there's, no, there's no new ideas uh, at all. It's what you do with the old ideas yes, and put them exactly. together. And, and exactly. Was, yeah. Um, I, we're running out of time. There's so many, so many more things I wanted to ask you about. Um, what... Big thing that you're uh, really into and, and which Sewing Bee promotes um, very well as well is sustainable fashion. And what do you think the industry could be doing more to to help there? Well, basically, we all need to buy less, less. clothes. Mm. And the industry is all to do with money. Yeah. Like, yeah. you know, now a lot of designers do more than two it always used to be two collections a year mm. now i think they do five or you mm. know yeah yeah i think but it's very very complicated mm. i think you know you think for instance there are clothes you can um get online that you wear and you can send them back but they've got to be posted yeah They've got to be dry cleaned. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So it sounds great and mm. it is better than, well, is it? I don't know. I think you potentially had the right idea when you were a kid and steal clothes from your parents <laughs> yes. and repurpose them into what you want yeah. them to be. Well, that's what we did. That's yeah. And I think young people are doing that now as well, mm. buying from charity shops yeah. and things. But I tell you something interesting that I have found with charity shops is, so when I was young, I bought 1930s clothes and things like that. So that was 30 years before. Now in the shops, in charity shops and things, you've got 90s and 80s stuff. Mm. But I think because I lived through that as an adult, I sort of don't connect with it. Well, actually, I've got an Eve Saint Laurent Mac that I got from a charity shop. And I've got this fantastic Valentino Lurex jumper with huge shoulder pads. Wow. But I'd like to see you on that. That was a charity shop. <laughs> I couldn't definitely couldn't have afforded it in real life. Yeah, yeah. What a charity shop that is. I'd like to go to that oh, charity I know. shop. But actually, now what they're doing at charity shops is they're picking out the designer things 
and they're making shops that only have the designer things in, and they're much more expensive. Yeah, yeah. Than La- they used to be. Last question. It's okay. just a quick one because I, um, it's just another detail in the book which I had no idea about. You've got an obsession with skeleton heads. <gasps> yes. What, what is this? I don't know. You just <gasps> love skeleton heads? Um, like from all animals? Yes. Well, I don't chop their heads off. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. <laughs> but <laughs> when I'm in Greece, yeah. Um, for instance, the last, was it the last time I was in Greece? I found a ram's head. It was a dead ram and I found the head. Yeah. So I took it back to where I was staying, boiled it up, put it out in the sun and put it in my suitcase. And so you've got how many of these at home? Um, my, well, not quite Ten? sure. 20? No, not that many. Okay. To say. Right. I've got a skeleton of... Anyway, I... They are fascinating. Oh, I've got a boar's head that a friend of mine, who's a cook, gave me, which I boiled up. And, yeah. yeah. So you, I mean, uh, fine. I, d- I just wanted to know the answer, really. I just sort of yeah. picture your flat as having hundreds of... Well, no, not hundreds. Yeah, okay. Not hundreds. Yeah, yeah. Well, they are fascinating things, but... No, uh, they are. Yeah. Absolutely. I'm, not, I'm sort of slightly terrified of them, really. I'd quite like a cat one. Okay, I'll, I'll let you know if I see it. Well, I'll tell you what happened to me. I found this dead bird <laughs> when I was walking back from college. Yeah. And I went, I took it home, but it all fell to pieces. Oh, I'm so sorry. So am I. What a lovely story to end this interview on. <laughs> I love it. Esme, it's been a delight chatting to you, as oh, thank always you. is. And um, the book is so brilliant. And uh, I was talking to my sister about it. I, I hope you don't mind. I sent her the copy that you sent oh, me. Okay. And um, she um, she reads a bit, but uh, we're ne- neither of us are particularly um, voracious readers. And we both inhaled the book. Like, oh. we, it's brilliantly written. And it's just an extraordinary uh, life that you've lived. And yeah, thrilled to be uh, thrilled to be asked to come and speak to you. So, oh, thank you. Behind the scenes, Esme Young is out now. You can get it wherever you like to buy your books. As my young, thank you very much. Well, thank you, Joe. Let's go and have a drink, shall we? Yes, okay. definitely. <laughs>